Greetings, this is Greg. The topic of the German super aces seemed to come up a lot, and the pilot generally considered to be at the top of that list is Eric Hartmann. He's credited with 352 aerial victories, he survived the war, and according to most, was never shot down. Spoiler alert, I think his kill numbers are legit, and I'll explain that later using some factors I haven't seen others consider. However, I'm not buying the never shot down bit, so let's dive in. Shot down, what does that mean anyway? I suppose it's when an aircraft takes enemy fire, damaging it severely enough so that it can no longer fly. However, there are some gray areas here. On one hand, if the plane gets hit by enemy fire and a wing comes off or the plane blows up, clearly it's been shot down. But fights often didn't end that way. Maybe the plane gets hit, but the pilot can nurse the damaged plane along for 30 minutes until over friendly territory, where he bails out. Or maybe he makes it back to base, but crashes on landing. In my view, in both of these cases, while the plane may not have been shot down for the purposes of a victory claim, there was clearly a winner and a loser in the preceding fight, and the losing plane was destroyed exactly as if it did have a wing blown off. But it gets more confusing. What if your plane takes a hit to the fuel tank, it's leaking fuel, and consequently the engine quits due to fuel starvation during the battle? You land in a field, the plane is repaired the next day, and you fly it out of there. Were you shot down? Let's see what a much higher authority has to say on this subject. We all know the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, the World War I ace of aces with 80 kills to his credit, and yes, I know that René Fonck, the Frenchman, likely shot down more, but we're going with official numbers here. Did you know the Red Baron wrote an autobiography? Well, he did, and it's quite good. There are several translations of it. I have two of them. This is my hardcover copy of the book. I've read it several times, and it just so happens not only does Richthofen have something to say on this subject, he was in this sort of situation once himself. That is, he found himself in a field after a hit to the fuel tank and wondered if he should consider himself shot down or not. He had been attacking a two-seater, and the plane's gunner hit Richthofen's fuel tank. The Baron immediately shut down his engine to minimize the risk of fire or explosion, dove to the earth, and landed in a field. The ensuing story about the Germans who picked him up after his forced landing is quite comical. I'll post that entire section at the end of this video so you can read it if you want. I can do that because obviously it's well out of copyright. Now there are multiple translations of this book. In the two that I have, this section is titled, quote, shot down, unquote. That's a pretty clear title. I'll put both sections on screen. He makes it clear that while this situation might be considered a shoot-down, he thinks it's a bit of a gray area. That's actually my entire point here. There are enough gray areas that even the Red Baron himself was not sure if his own situation counted as a shoot-down. I suppose it could be argued that if, as a result of enemy fire, you don't make it back to base, and especially if your plane is totaled in the resulting off-airport landing, then that should count as being shot down. Does it really matter in a practical sense if the wing is blown off and the pilot bails out, or if the plane is damaged so badly it's balled up in a field 20 minutes later? Either way, the plane is lost due to enemy fire. I'm going to say that both were shot down, and I'm not alone in this. It's the way the scoring system works in most simulators, and in real life it works this way too, in the cases when the destruction of the plane can be verified. For example, in the USAAF, if a pilot shot down a plane, and, or correction, let's say the pilot shoots up an airplane and it's out of control, streaming smoke, and disappears below the clouds, that was counted as a probable. If later evidence showed up that it eventually crashed, even if it eventually crashed 20 miles away, a kill was awarded, or a aerial victory was awarded. That brings us to Eric Hartman. Was he ever shot down? According to him, no, but he did have at least 14 crash landings and bailed out once. Let's look at that bailout. In Hartman's own words from his last interview, quote, I half rolled and recovered to fire on another of the three remaining enemy airplanes and flamed him as well. As soon as that happened, I was warned that I had several more on my tail. 
So I headed for the deck, a swarm of eight Americans behind me. That is a very uncomfortable feeling, I can tell you. I made jerking turns left and right as they fired, but they fired from too far away to be effective. I was headed for the base so the defensive guns would help me, but I ran out of fuel and had to bail out. I was certain that this one pilot was lining me up for a strafe, but he banked away and looked at me waving. I landed four miles from the base. I almost made it. That day we lost half our aircraft. We were too outnumbered, and many of the young pilots were inexperienced." Unquote. So, he was in a fight by himself against eight P-51s. They were shooting at him. He doesn't say they didn't hit him. He says that due to range, their fire was ineffective. Then he says he ran out of fuel and bailed out. At that point, a P-51 lined up on him as if to shoot him while he's in his parachute, but didn't. The 51 just flew past and waved. In this case, I'll argue that if, hit, if Hartman was hit and then bailed out, then, out of fuel or not, he was shot down. Fighting against eight P-51s, I think it's likely that they scored at least some hits, maybe not a real death blow, but I think it's likely Hartman's 109 had some 50 caliber rounds in it when he bailed out of it. Now, is there any evidence for this? Yes, I think so. This is a book by Bob Goebel, a Mustang ace with 11 aerial victories, all against 109s, and some of those... Uh, over Romania. Now, I want to be clear that nowhere in this book does Goebel claim to have shot down Hartman, but as many others have pointed out, one of his encounters lines up very well with Hartman's, and both accounts were written independently and thus without knowledge of each other. Let's see what Goebel has to say from his book. Quote, I spotted two ME-109s above at about one o'clock. I think the leader saw my flight about the same time. He had balls, I'll say that for him. The two 109s started down to attack the bombers below the four of us. It was a rash act indeed. Perhaps he had recently come from the Eastern Front and had no fear of Russian fighters, but we were not the yaks or migs he was used to fooling with. We broke into them. In 30 seconds, he had realized his mistake. I tried to follow my man, but didn't have enough speed. In military emergency power, I just managed to stagger over the top of the loop, but once I got the nose down, I accelerated quickly. Now I began to close the distance. I stayed slightly low in his blind spot. The German continued his descending high-speed run. Now the 109 almost filled my sight. I had to be in range now. Surely I was no more than 200 yards away. I had the pipper low in the center of his fuselage when I squeezed off the first short burst. No strikes. Quickly, raising the pipper to almost the tip of his tail, I fired again and was rewarded this time with strikes quick flashing around the fuselage and wing roots. Then his prop wash flew me off momentarily. Before I could get the sights back on him for another burst, the pilot left his airplane. Putting the gun switch into camera-only position, I made a pass at him, being careful to break off so my slipstream would not collapse his canopy. As I passed to the side of him, I raised my glove hand in a half-wave salute and then reformed my flight. The latest victory brought my total to four." Unquote. This account lines up shockingly well with Hartman's. The time, place, and description of the fight are all in agreement. The P-51 lining up as if it's going for a gun pass on Hartman while he's in his parachute and then banking away uh, and the pilot waving, that really seals the deal for me. By the way, most don't know that the P-51 had a position for camera only. I don't think it was used much and certainly not to film somebody in their parachute. If that gun camera footage could be found, that would be incredible, but I think it's either been lost to time or is misfiled somewhere. Even without the camera footage, these accounts line up just too well to ignore. Not perfectly. With the fog of war, I would not expect them to, but darn close. I first saw this brought up in a magazine article probably 20 years ago or more. If you search for information on this, you'll find all sorts of articles and places that say, Goebel shot down Hartman. It's interesting that on this page from the Miramar National Cemetery, they say Goebel shot down Hartman. 
I find that interesting because Goebel isn't buried there, so I, I wonder why they talk about that on, that on their website. Anyway, I think Goebel shot Hartman down. Not that it was anything like a fair fight, it was eight to one, but I do think it happened. Of course, most of Hartman's uh, aerial victories were not the result of fair fights. That's just the way air combat worked. Just going by Hartman's account alone, though, I think it's unlikely that eight of those P-51s um, didn't score any hits. Not that I'm saying I think Eric Hartman was lying um, about having never been shot down. I'm not saying that at all. I think that, like the Red Baron, he recognized there were gray areas and felt that the term shot down didn't apply to his situation. Hartman's account shows that he got into a fight with a group of 51s and tried to dive away. That would have worked fine against most Soviet fighters, but not against P-51s. He was not able to escape and had to bail out in order to survive. Even if this wasn't a shoot-down, I think clearly he was defeated by the P-51s. Looked at another way, there were probably times Hartman was shooting at a Soviet fighter when the pilot subsequently bailed out. Hartman and any witnesses to that event would have given him the credit. In a post-war interview, maybe that Soviet pilot in question claimed he only bailed out because he was out of fuel, but that wouldn't change anything. What about the 14 times Hartman crash landed? His story is that every one of those it was due to either mechanical failure or debris from an enemy aircraft striking his plane and disabling it. Really? So none of those times he was hit by enemy fire? I find that unlikely. I certainly can't prove otherwise, but I think it's far more likely than not that some Soviet tail gunner got some rounds into his plane before those crash landings, and I think it's likely some of those rounds, on at least some of those occasions, disabled his engine via an oil cooler radiator or a fuel system, some other critical hit. Probably didn't happen much, but I think it did happen. At this point, some of you are probably pounding your fist on the table, accusing me of some sort of anti-German bias, and that's okay. I get accused of bias every day on this channel. Sometimes it's anti-German bias, sometimes it's anti-U.S. bias, and sometimes anti-British bias. The way I see it, that actually means I'm unbiased. Now let's take a look at Hartman's, Hartman's uh, 352 number. There's some debate about it. There was a Soviet author who claimed that he could only match about 70 or 80 of them to Soviet records. However, the vast majority of researchers have found that 352 number to be verifiable, at least mostly so. I also find it to be reasonable, although I'm looking at it from a different perspective. As I go through Hartman's statistics, do you know what really stands out to me? It's not the number of kills. It's the fact that he stayed alive and was never really injured or knocked out of combat for any period of time. Those two things are not in dispute. He survived the war and had no big gaps in his flying due to injuries. But when you account for that, his total number of kills looks quite reasonable. I'd say even normal. Let me explain. We all know that the U.S. aces had relatively low kill numbers as compared with the Axis aces, and we know that because the U.S. pilots, um, we know that that's because the U.S. pilots flew relatively few missions and in environments where there were fewer targets before being sent back to the United States. By the way, I'm using the word kills to mean an aircraft kill in the air. It's just easier than saying aerial victory over and over. So with that in mind, Let's compare Robert S. Johnson with 28 kills, and yes, he had 28. The earlier 27 number was revised. Anyway, compare that to Hartman's 352. Obviously, Hartman's number is far higher, but how much higher is it per mission flown? And understand that I'm not trying to compare these two pilots. I'm trying to prove that the 352 number is entirely reasonable. Robert S. Johnson flew 91 missions. Most of these missions were flown when the Luftwaffe, in terms of skill and quality of equipment, was at its peak. In other words, he had difficult targets. All of his kills were against fighters, and only a very small number were against the softer targets like BF-110s. That means he averaged one kill every 3.25 missions. 
and I can't stress enough that this was against relatively tough opponents. Eric Hartman flew at least 1,400 missions. In his final interview, he guessed about 1,456, so I'm going to go with that. That means he shot down one plane every 4.14 missions, fewer planes per mission than Robert S. Johnson. Thus, his kill count of 352 is largely the result of staying alive and healthy long enough to fly those 1,400 plus missions. Let's take a look at some of the other super aces for comparison to see how he did this. I'm just making up the term super ace for this video. I'm defining it as a pilot with 200 or more kills. I have to do something here in order to make, in order to have a manageable number as there were just so many German aces. There were 15 German aces with 200 kills or more. Here's the list. Here are the numbers of missions flown per kill. This list is not in any particular order. We're not looking at total kills. We're not comparing pilots. We're just looking at the numbers of missions flown per kill. In other words, it's the missions flown divided by the kills. The data comes from the book I mentioned at the top. This is considered to be the definitive work on this subject and is a very well-researched document using data from the German archives. At one end of the scale, we have Walter, Walter Nowotny with a kill every 1.71 missions, which is extraordinary. I'll give more details on Nowotny and the others later in the video. For now, we're just looking at these numbers. Now, at the other end of the scale, we have Heinrich Barr with a kill every 4.54 missions. So Hartman's number of 4.14 missions show that it's not that he was shooting down planes at an unrealistic or superhuman rate. Well, maybe a bit superhuman, but not by the standards of the German super races we're looking at here, and not even as high a rate as Robert S. Johnson, who shot down a plane uh, every 3.25 missions. I think this shows that the 352 kill number for Hartman is realistic. And the reason it's so high is specifically because he flew over 1,400 missions, more than any of the others, and by a long shot. There are three main reasons he was able to fly so many missions relative to the other super aces. First, he didn't die in combat. Second, he only flew on the Eastern Front, which meant more missions per day as compared with the pilots defending the Reich on the Western Front. Third, his career was never interrupted by a serious injury or a nervous breakdown or anything else that would take him out of combat. For comparison, let's take a quick, very abbreviated look at the fates of all of these aces. A surprising number of them survived the war, which clearly suggests that just staying alive is a big key to running up a high number of kills, which of course makes sense. Five of them didn't survive, but let's run through all 15 of them quickly. Please understand I'm not trying to do justice and tell the full story of each of them. These are just quick summaries. Hans Philipp had just over 200 kills. At one time, he was the leading German pilot in terms of planes shot down. He flew in the Battle of Britain and then on the Eastern Front. He was transferred to the Western Front in April of 43 and was shot down by a P-47 Thunderbolt flown by Robert S. Johnson in October of 43. His parachute didn't open, and of course he was killed. Hermann Graf was primarily an Eastern Front pilot. He had 212 kills with 10 on the Western Front, and some of those against the British. He was injured fighting the USAAF in March of 44, which kept him out of combat effectively for the rest of the war. From October of 44 on, he was wing commander of JG-52. Heinrich Barr, this one is interesting. Barr was a sort of Pappy Boyington type. They were the same age and always in trouble. Barr was constantly being reprimanded, demoted, or somehow punished. He was almost shot once for insubordination. However, that 4.54 number suggests that he was not a wild card in the air, at least not by the standards we're looking at here. I should also say that he was probably the German ace with the most success against the USAAF. He shot down 14 four-engine bombers, and way over half of his kills were against US and British aircraft. That alone partially explains his high number of missions per kill. 
Heinrich Barr had a nervous breakdown while, fight, while, while fighting the USAAF and the RAF in the Mediterranean. Gunter Rahl was injured fighting the USAAF. He actually claimed this saved his life because it took him out of action during the period late in the war when it was very dangerous to be a Luftwaffe pilot on the Western Front. Gerhard Barkhorn, the only pilot other than Hartmann with over 300 kills, he had a lot of weight on his shoulders and had a nervous breakdown on the Western Front. Heinrich Erler, this is one that's also really interesting. I'm sure most of you know about the German battleship Tirpitz. It was sunk by RAF Lancasters, which flew in with no Luftwaffe opposition. Although Erler wasn't tasked with defending the ship, because his squadron was based nearby, he was an easy scapegoat and was tried and sentenced, basically blamed for the loss of the Tirpitz and all of the resulting casualties. Unjustly so, in my opinion. Once set free, he went back to flying. He eventually flew 262s and became a jet ace. He had nine kills on the Western Front, eight of them in the 262. Now, there's some dispute about how and even when, meaning the exact date that he died, but the most accepted version is that on his last flight, he shot down two B-17s and sent a final radio message. I'm paraphrasing, but he said to his friend, I'm out of ammo, going to Ram, I'll see you in Valhalla. Erler's body and wreckage, uh, the wreckage of his 262, were found in 2018, so pretty recently. They've not yet been recovered. I find it interesting, and it actually makes me a bit happy to know that aviation archaeology is an ongoing thing. If you want to know more about that, search for this guy. He is the one that found Erler's 262. Walter Nowotny, 256 kills, probably all but one on the Eastern Front. Against the Soviets, he would often shoot down multiple planes in one day. On two separate occasions, he shot down 10 planes each day. When he went up against the USAAF on the Western Front, he got one kill before his death in a 262, most likely as a result of machine gun fire from P-51s. Eric Hartman flew only on the Eastern Front. Of course, he did battle U.S. fighters on a few occasions, as by 1944 they were venturing pretty far east. Officially, two of his kills were against P-51s flown by the USAAF. All others were against Soviet pilots. There is some dispute there, but all this data is from the sources I have listed above. Otto Cattell had all of his kills on the Eastern Front and was the only one killed by enemy action there. Theodore Weissenberger, uh, he was another wild card, and this time his number of missions flown per kill really reflects that. Part of the reason it's that low is because he had several ace-in-a-day events. He spent the last year of the war on the Western Front and most of that time in leadership roles. Of his 208 kills or so, 33 were on the Western Front, and those include seven four-engine bombers. After the war, he, he became a race car driver and uh, died in a race car accident at the Nürburgring. Eric Rudorfer fought through the entire war and was on the Western Front, Eastern Front, and in the Mediterranean. Of his 222 kills, 60 were on the Western Front but the majority of those were early in the war against the British. I don't think he went back to the Western Front to face the USAAF until 1945 and then in the 262, but I'm not sure about that. He survived the war. He became an airline pilot and lived to be 98 years old, passing away in 2016. It's unusual for airline pilots to live that long, let alone ones that flew in combat. Uh, he must have lived a somewhat healthy lifestyle or had amazing genetics or something. I realize uh, I really need to wrap this up. I know I'm not doing justice to these guys, but the purpose of this video is to determine the reasonableness of that 352 number. So let's move on more quickly. Anton Hafner was primarily a North Africa and Eastern Front pilot who died when his plane hit a tree. He was the only one to perish in a flying accident. Bats and Liepfert were both Eastern Front pilots, although Bats did have a few kills against the USAAF when they ventured as far east as Romania. 
Walter Schuck flew on both fronts, was wounded on both, and as you can probably tell by this picture, survived the war. He then became a school teacher and sort of faded into the background. I don't think he wrote any books or gave any post-war interviews. He lived to be 94. So when we put all this together, I think we have a pretty good picture of why Hartman was able to survive for so long and, then, and thus run up such a large number of kills. First of all, 75% of the Super Ace deaths caused by enemy action were caused by the U.S. Army Air Force, only 25%, just one by the Soviets, and none by the British, partially because by the time the Super Aces reached 200 kills, they were less likely to encounter the British. They still did, just not that often as compared with encounters with the USAAF. That means statistically a Super Ace's chances of survival go down dramatically when facing the Americans. Hartman rarely had to deal with this risk, maybe two or three times, and in one of those cases he had a close call and had to bail out. So just his lack of contact with the Americans increased his odds of survival massively. It's much the same when we look at wounded pilots taken out of action. Again, 75% were the result of combat with the USAAF, 25% from combat with the Soviets. Note, that doesn't mean necessarily wounded by bullets from enemy fire. In some cases, it was an injury from bailing out. And keep in mind, this chart isn't perfect. These are just the incidents I know about. For example, I suspect Weissenberger was wounded and out of action at some point, but I don't have any solid evidence for that. But just looking at his time in service versus number of missions flown, it looks to me like he was out of action at some point, and it's likely that that was because of being wounded. But again, I don't know, um, and there's certainly no evidence of it that I found. We have two nervous breakdowns here. Again, these are just the ones that I know about. Both happened when primarily fighting the U.S. Army Air Force, although they were also dealing with some British air action at the time, so that could be a component. Hartman had minimal contact with these opponents and, to my knowledge, never had any sort of nervous breakdown during the war, thus didn't lose any combat time. Of the 15 super aces, Weissenberger really stands out here. He's the only one that fought the Americans over the Reich during the last 13 months of the war and came out relatively unscathed. Furthermore, a lot of his time there was in 109s before switching to the 262. So I think a key component in Hartman's high kill number is the number of missions he flew and the reason he was able to fly so many missions is because he stayed on the Eastern Front. Even when a 262 on the Western Front was offered to them, he chose to stay in the East out of loyalty to his squadron. I don't think he knew it at the time, but that probably saved his life. The 4.14 number shows that he was at least somewhat careful, which also helped him to stay alive long enough to run up that score. Of course, he was also a very good pilot. I think that goes without saying. A good shot, good tactician, had good situational awareness. But I don't know that he was any better in those regards than Rawl, Graf, or any of the others on this list. Maybe he was. There's no way to know. But looking at the stats, the difference seems to be more about who they were fighting and how often than the skill level of the individual pilots. And we're talking about the skill level of the super aces here. These super aces and other German aces were often able to shoot down five or sometimes even ten or more Soviet aircraft in a day. But once up against the Americans, that changed. That didn't happen anymore. In summary, I think it's entirely reasonable that Hartman shot down 352 enemy aircraft. He did this by flying a lot of missions and staying alive. His number of missions per kill shows that he was probably not overclaiming. Those numbers compare pretty well with other German and even U.S. aces. On the other hand, I'm not buying the never shot down claim. I think he was shot down by a P-51 and probably by the Soviets a time or two. He had a bailout and 14 force landings. The odds that none of those were due to bullets, fuel, or oil in the cooling system seem pretty low to me. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters for making this channel possible. 
On my Patreon page, I often have early release videos, an unreleased video is there, and um, I have a lot of books and aircraft manuals for reference. I'll get a copy of the Red Baron's book up on there ASAP. Anyway, again, I really appreciate all of you watching this video and especially the Patreon supporters. Goodbye for now and have a great day. Just one more thing. This is where I made the video. This is my hotel room. I'm in Incheon, South Korea. That's just west of Seoul. Incheon is a big industrial location uh, with a lot of shipping out of here. It's on the coast. I'm in a hotel, 48th floor, goes up to 60 stories or something like that. So that gives you an idea of the height of these buildings out here. These are these are big buildings. And uh, well, there's the Sheraton, another hotel. The point I'm trying to make is the amount of construction, and especially high-rise construction, that's in Asia. A lot of this stuff has cropped up in the last 10, 20 years. And I don't think you can tell in the video, but the mountain range that's farthest away, it's about, I don't know, it's probably 40 or 50 miles in that direction. Uh, there are high-rises pretty much all the way out to there, with the exception of the area right by the river, where obviously you can't build, and then smaller areas for parking lots and roads and stuff. But it's pretty much continual high-rises for about 40 miles in that direction, and probably 10 miles in this direction, or may, maybe more. Actually, there's I see some poking up on the other sides of those mountains, so I can't really tell. And then in this direction, Another 40 miles, and again, nothing but solid high-rises. Just what's visible from my window here is a larger metropolitan area. And this isn't even Seoul, this is Incheon. This is a larger metropolitan area, from what I can see, than um, New York and Chicago combined, at least insofar as the downtown areas go. You know, the way they draw the lines on the map, maybe I don't know. But... but just looking out at the, the sea of high-rises here is just incredible. There, there's nowhere in the world outside of Asia that's like this. Uh, may, maybe India or Thailand, but I haven't been to India, and I've spent almost no time in Thailand. But uh, certainly nothing like this in the United States or Europe. And uh, again, it's hard to get an idea of the, the scale of this looking at the video, but I just thought it was something that I would share with you guys. Anyway, have a good day. Goodbye.